Good evening. Welcome to the Pasadena Commission on the Status of Women, Her Story event. We are thrilled that you could join us tonight. My name is Lorena Yepes Hernandez. I am the chair to the commission. And also from the commission, we have Vice Chair Norma Fernandez, <laughs> Commissioner Charlotte Bland, <laughs> Commissioner Marna Cornell, um, Commissioner Evan McCrary, Commissioner Lorraine Montgomery, Commissioner Jessica Rivas, and Commissioner Ann Wolf. Our dear friend, Commissioner Nichelle Holliday, could not be here with us tonight. Unfortunately, her mom passed away yesterday. And I share that because we know that many of us are friends with the family, so we just wanted to share so we can pass along our condolences. Um, tonight, we are also honored to have Councilwoman Margaret McCoston. <laughs> District Representative Dominic Corey from Senator Portantino's office. District Representative Teresa Lamb Simpson from Congressman Schiff's office. We also want to give a special recognition to George Forlardo from Pasadena Media for being our media partner. In addition to all these fabulous people, we have the count with the presence of over 25 organizations that have partnered with us today to make this event successful. Um, there are two um, additional sponsors that were not listed in all the print and so we just want to give recognition to the Student Equity Office at PCC and the Flintridge Foundation. So the Commission on the Status of Women's mission statement states that the purpose of the commission is to advise the council on special needs and concerns of women of all ages, races, religions, ethnic and cultural backgrounds, and economic and social circumstances. Today, we are gathered here to recognize and honor our local sheroes for Women's History Month, or Her Story Month, as the Commission on the Status of Women has named this event. We will be hearing her story from both Dolores Hickenbottom and Dolores and Roberta Martinez. Sorry about that. But first, we will hear from our only woman currently serving on the Pasadena City Council, our council member, Margaret McCoston. Hi, everybody. It's, it's so nice to be back here. I, I am remembering last year when I came, and we were we were fresh off the first Women's March, remember? And we were all so excited, and I, was, and I said, oh my God, we have a sexual predator, misogynist in the White House. <laughs> and I forgot to say racist, okay? So just wanna, just wanna clear that up, so we all, so that's corrected. Liar. But, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, only ha I only have so many minutes, so. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, but I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, after that first Women's March. Hi, Jackie. Um, this is the year, after that March, this is the year that women really moved into action, right? We were. We were, you know, our hair was on fire, and we were sad, and we were scared, and we were frustrated, and we took our frustration and our sadness and our anger and our money, and we did what women do. We got to work, right? So I just have a few little numbers I want to share. A, a record number of women are running for office in 2018. 326 non-incumbent women are running for house seats. Yeah, that's great. 38 non-incumbent women are running for the Senate. 
in the 2016 election cycle, 920 women reached out to EMILY's list for information and assistance about running for office. This year, over 30,000 women have reached out to EMILY's list. So, as I say, um, it's a new day. And women are coming into power and things are changing. So the Time's Up initiative, which came from the Me Too movement, tells us that one in three women between 18 and 34 have been sexually harassed at work. I, I'm not going to, anyway, yeah. 71% of those women say they did not report it. Because that's the way things were. But things are not like that anymore. So when I say we got to work, the Time's Up Legal Fund, for example, you know, all those women, they did something. And they have raised over $21 million in two months for a legal defense fund for women who don't have the funds to fight for their rights. So women are doing amazing things. And it's, it's out of a time like this, it's when women, the worst things happen to women, that women rise up and do the best things. And that's where we are today. So <clears throat> I think it's actually a wonderful time to be a woman. It's very exciting between the youth movement, the women's movement, the sort of progressive movement, the empowerment that we see people feeling all over the country. It's a really, really exciting time. So I'm very proud to be a woman, and we should all make sure we do everything we can to support and help all the women we know in whatever endeavor it is they choose to do. So I am delighted to be here again this year to support the work of the Commission on the Status of Women and the women that we support here tonight. But I do want to remind everybody, it's a new day. So thank you very much. Are you coming up? Marna. <laughs> okay, so everyone knows Marna for now. Um, I'm just going to introduce this. Okay, but I'm going to introduce you because she's been such a power on the commission and also in her neighborhood. Uh, uh, Marna's a constituent of mine and she lives on one of the power streets uh, that have very, a bunch of very, very active women. So, anyway, thanks Thank for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. We are so lucky to have Margaret on the council. We are so lucky. Jackie was here. She was with her cute little baby. She formerly was on the council. And, and we're going to hear about more other women, but not a lot <laughs> on our city. OK, I'm just here for a couple of minutes. And we have two wonderful speakers. And I have that are going to tell their stories that we're here to honor. And my job is just to introduce briefly Dolores. I'm not telling her story. That's for her to tell. But I just want to tell you what Dolores does for me. She makes my heart sing. She makes me just so proud to be part of her community. She is inspiring. She is lovable. And you know they say the world is run by the people who show up. And Dolores has shown up and shown up and shown up. Give her a big welcome for showing up again. Thank you, Dolores. Well, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> my, my son, who's a lawyer, they both are, but he said, I have not learned that no is a complete sentence. <laughs> I keep saying yes. Uh, at the outset, I want to say two things Roberta and I were talking about, how difficult it is to talk about ourselves 
using I, I, I. So I wanted to say two things about it. Number one, the only speech class I took in college, the professor said the secret of public speaking is stand up, speak up, and shut up. <laughs> and so unfortunate. But that might be a little harder because Marnie told us that we have to do all, have to tell all these things about ourselves. So the other part of it is, uh, if I, when I'm saying the I, it's going to be because my friend Lois Richard and I, the late Lois Richard and I, are both grandparents and we'd get together sometimes and we would brag about our grandchildren. And if my granddaughter or her grandson overheard us telling something nice about them, they would say, it's not nice to brag. <laughs> but Lois had, a, Lois had a comeback. She said, well, tell them if what they're saying is true, it's not bragging, it's sharing information. <laughs> so that's what I mean. But I'll, I'll start with mine. First of all, I'd like to point out, because of my funny voice, that I'm a nine-year thyroid cancer survivor. And because of that, so my voice may get a little weak, and if it gets too weak, I have my daughter as my reader here to continue. But uh, I was born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was educated in Catholic schools and graduated from Xavier University Preparatory, Xavier Prep. After graduation, I enlisted in the United States Army, during which time I received an outstanding basic training award. I was assigned to Fort Ord, California, where I met my future husband, Elby, then a young officer having served overseas in World War II. Walking past him one day on base, oblivious to him, his uniform and rank, I failed to acknowledge him. He then asked me sternly, don't you salute officers? That's what, that's he reminded me about this requirement and I did so. Years later, I got my vengeance though. <laughs> years, years later, when his older sister, Verdi, who outranked him as an Air Force officer, would visit us at Fort Orr and he was in uniform and she in uniform, he had to salute her. <laughs> and I must say, he would try to avoid her in uniform and avoid saluting her. However, he was extremely proud of her, and I want to talk about her. She graduated from Tuskegee University, and in the military service, she served with the Tuskegee Airmen. And she, my sister-in-law, Major Verdier and Bottom, is one of my sheroes. Graduating from Tuskegee Institute during the, the time of Booker T. Washington, with a degree in English. She returned to Pasadena with plans to teach. She, she and all her siblings had graduated from John Muir High School and had attended Washington and Cleveland. Yet no blacks were being hired as teachers in PUSD at that time. So she returned to Tuskegee, Alabama and taught elementary school in a small town, Lanier, Alabama. When the Tuskegee experiment launched there, she was intrigued and joined the Army Corps, Army Air Corps. Subsequently, she was among the first women officers commissioned in the regular Air Force. During her career, she served as operations officer for the Tuskegee Airmen, 332nd Fighter Group. Many of the airmen with whom she served were among the 16 original I may have some of this water after all. I said well, hot water, but I guess I'll have some of this. Thank you. I just thought it was important to tell her story because she's no longer with us. Many of the airmen she served with were among the 16 original Tuskegee Airmen who rode in the 2010 Rose Parade float, honoring their service. A cut above, as a member of the Los Angeles chapter, of the Tuskegee Airmen Inc. in Pasadena Legion 13, I was pleased in playing a role in honoring these heroes. They are in the mayor's trophy, the former mayor Bill Borgard himself, an Air Force captain. I would like to add that I'm still a member of the uh, Los Angeles Tuskegee Airmen, 
And all of these 16 men were all in their either late 80s or 90s. About six of them have died. But what you need, you might want to know about them is that they told me when they turned on Colorado Boulevard and saw everybody standing up, they were overwhelmed. They could not believe it. Now these are men who were fighter pilots, and many of them had, well, one of them, one was the, uh, the intelligence officer. And I will tell another story about that. In 2010, I met Senator Inouye for the first time. He was at, he was at uh, PCC, and he shared with us, some people here may remember that, because I had never heard it before. He had never heard the, he had never told the story in public. He was injured in Romatelli, Italy, and that's where the Tuskegee Airmen were stationed. Nobody knew that these escort pilots were black, because that's, that's the way it was then. But he was wounded in the hills in Romatelli. He was so severely injured that they didn't think he was going to live. There was such anti-Japanese sentiment that none of the white soldiers would give him a transfusion. When he got down to the field hospital, he was almost dead. When he told, they wanted to, they just called the chaplain in. And he said, no, I would like to go ahead and try just having my arm amputated. But there was none of the whites who wanted to give him a transfusion. The Tuskegee Airmen gave him a transfusion. And he said he told that story in public for the first time. So I just thought I would give you that a little bit of information because it was news to me as well. Uh, as a member of American Legion Force 13, we hosted a reception for the Tuskegee Airmen in 2010. And in 2012, I worked with Congressman Adam Schiff, one of my heroes, for the dedication of the Pasadena Main Post Office in honor of Tuskegee Airmen First Lieutenant Oliver Goodall, the first and only post office to be named for a Tuskegee Airman. And following this um, event, we had a reception that was hosted by Post 13 and Tuskegee Airmen. When my husband and I, going back to my story, when my husband and I decided to marry, as our dating was then technically fraternization, <laughs> It required the base commander's permission for an officer to marry an enlisted woman. And I must say here, we have a friend, Reverend George Van Alstyne, who can be quite a, cut up at times. He told my husband once, he said, you know, you outranked her, but she outflanked you. <laughs> well, then as a first lieutenant, my husband was assigned to the general subjects committee which processed all recruits who received weapons training, military code of conduct, and according to Ray Cartinas, his assistant, how to crawl under a, a barbed wire fence and not get cut. <laughs> uh, later on, of course, Ray became superintendent. And because he too was a Pasadena, as was my husband, he would ride home with us. And uh, we had a good time with that. Also serving in that company was Clint Eastwood. My daughter had no problem with that. But the fact is, he was, he was there. Right. <laughs> but he was there as an instructor. Ray being a, car, being a Pasadena, he would often come with us to ride. He was my daughter Anne Marie's first babysitter. And he told me to tell that. While at Fort Ord, my daughters Anne Marie and Leslie were born. We were, then assigned, we were then assigned to Schofield Barracks in Hawaii, where L.B. Jr. Skip, whom you probably have been seen in the paper, um, was born. After tours in Fort Benning, Georgia, and Fort Leonardwood, Missouri, we moved to L.B.'s hometown of Pasadena, where my son John was born at Huntington Memorial Hospital. My early, let me get some more water. My early inspiration to serve came from my paternal grandfather, Edward Dupree, who believed that service to others is the highest calling. And from my mother, Lillian Hippolito Dupree, who believed that, 
who conveyed to us that we should always look for the good in all people. I know that's hard sometimes, I guess, but she believed that, and so do I. Martin Luther King said, everybody can be great because anyone can serve. You don't have to have a college degree. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to, to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Love is the one force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. And it is fitting in this event that we be, to hold this at All Saints Church, as this church has been in the vanguard for civil rights and social justice for many, many, many years. And some of them, many icons in this community are in the church community are with us here. People like Monica Hubbard and, and uh, Alma Stokes. Thank you. She's giving me hot water because that helps my problem. <laughs> Uh, according to a quote from Monica Hubbard's uh, Altadena Women's Network, there is no power greater than a community discovering what it cares about. So in telling my story, I look to the heroes and sheroes that we've had among us. The people of the men and women of good char character who stood up, uh, stood up by voice and action for human rights and social justice for all. And their commitment and actions advanced progress for women, for children, and for all of us. I, rather than go into some of their thing now, I think I will go ahead and, and tell you about uh, two people who, with whom I worked. One is Loretta Glickman, and because she isn't here to tell her story, I shall do so. Loretta passed away, unfortunately, a number of years ago at, at age 55. The election of Loretta Glickman as mayor ended a historical period in the life of a community that once excluded blacks and other minorities from participation in much of the city's economic and social life. As was pointed out in a newspaper article at the time, she took on the mayorship carrying high expectations for the black and minority community many of whom saw in her the hope of rapid and far-reaching change and improvements in the Northwest. Some might have misgivings, not only questioning her capacity to do the job, but, share, but fearing she would push through changes that would harm the economic life of the city. A sober evaluation reveals that neither one was met. We didn't, she didn't have the, we didn't reach the highest hopes and it, did we have the fears realized. Said Glickman, I've learned a lot, particularly patience, and that you can't be all things to all people all the time. And you can't be anything to some people anytime. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but Loretta had a kind and giving heart. Loretta's first campaign manager recalls an incident when she and Loretta were working on something, when suddenly Loretta asked her, what time is it? Because she had to be somewhere. So Pat said, where do you have to be? She said, Dodger Stadium. And Pat said, for what? And she said, I have to be at Dodger Stadium to sing the national anthem. <laughs> and as Pat knew at the time, and I concur, people were constantly asking Loretta to appear, and she never said no. Mac Robinson, the, the brother of Jackie Robinson, summed up Loretta's tenure as mayor and said, I would like to see the city give her the credit for what she has done and not for the things that did not get done. It would take the cooperation of all of us and we're not going to get any until that situation is applied to the whole city. Lois Richard, a trailblazer in her own right, as a candidate for city council and the lead plaintiff in the legal suit challenging Pasadena's at-large system said, she served with grace and gave Pasadena a positive image and focused long overdue attention to Northwest Pasadena. But there are some humorous things to tell about Loretta. Loretta was vivacious, charming, and charismatic. Loretta shared her musical talents with churches, at community events, and especially with seniors with whom she frequently lunched and entertained. 
especially the seniors of Pilgrim Towers. Although the job of mayor was largely ceremonial at the time, with a strong city manager form of government, it is still time consuming. She presided over weekly council meetings, made countless appearances at community functions, and represented the council at city negotiations locally and out of town. Loretta helped to facilitate UCLA coming to the Rose Bowl, bringing two Super Bowls to Pasadena, and was in great demand as a speaker. At the first Super Bowl, she, being Loretta, was assisting a man who was carrying, at that time you could take beer in, some beer in his things, and he was having difficulty. So she assisted him to his seat in the 50-yard line area. So he asked her, well, who are you? She said, my name is Loretta, and I am the mayor of Pasadena. <laughs> well, he certainly did not believe that. <laughs> but two days later, later, these two wonderful uh, pictures of real, I mean, of uh, trains came to the office, and these huge bouquet of flowers. So much so that the, the city manager came, he said, did somebody die here? <laughs> but he apologized and he could not believe that this young woman was the mayor of Pasadena because of her. But we have another story about, about Loretta. And this has to do with, with her and the uh, Prince Philip. In 1982, the Prince of Wales, Prince Philip, visited Pasadena. The Tournament of Roses hosted a dinner for Prince Philip, to which Loretta attended as mayor of Pasadena. The day before the event, Loretta and I met and went over the agenda for the next day as we did regularly. During our meeting, I pointed out to Loretta, by custom, you never touch royalty. The next day, I was informed that Loretta not only touched Prince Philip, but hugged him. <laughs> when I asked her about it, she responded, he hugged me first. <laughs> And the tournament members confirmed that that was true. So in 1983, when Queen Elizabeth visited the British home in Sierra Madre, greeting each and every resident, when I discussed this with Loretta, I told her that my sources told me the Queen did not visit Pasadena because she heard that the female mayor of Pasadena had gotten a bit too friendly with the prince. <laughs> Of course I was joking and she was amused and laughed and laughed heartily. But as I said, she was charming and vivacious. And she had a generous spirit and a caring heart. Her, her home was always open to everyone at almost any time, day or night. She never met a stranger. This was due in part to her personality and background in church life and entertainment. She grew up in the church and was passionate about music and singing always willing to share her musical talents. She almost never turned down a request to play the piano and sing. She had a special affinity for children and seniors. And being a woman and the first black to hold the position in Pasadena put a lot of pressure on Loretta. This while raising two children. Bill Bogard said Loretta has worked very hard. He was the vice mayor and he followed Loretta's mayor and her efforts reflected very favorably on the city, particularly in the Northwest and among other minority groups and women. Though not directly elected, the significance of having two female mayors was more than symbolic. They became the public face of Pasadena, each in her own way, at a time when women were much underrepresented in all areas of, of city government. When a male colleague commented about back-to-back -back mayors to the outgoing mayor, Joe Heckman. She said, what's the big deal? We have had back-to-back -back men mayors for many years, <laughs> if, you have, if you haven't noticed. Uh, and so anyway, that was, I wanted to tell you about her because there's no doubt in my mind that her becoming mayor did make a difference in terms of, in the lives of a lot of people particularly minorities. Many people in the minority community had never been to City Hall except to pay a, to pay a utility bill or get a uh, small appliance repaired, which you could do at that time. 
So we, one of the things that we worked on was demystifying the whole experience and letting the people know that this is your government and you have a right to watch your government at work. We didn't have televised meetings at that time. So working together, we were able to get many things accomplished, at, at least many of the things we wanted to get. We not, didn't get them all, but by getting the cooperation of other people, such as the establishment of the Commission on the Status of Women. We were told at that time, well, why do we need a commission on the status of women when we have a human relations committee? Let's just put them all there. Well, that didn't go down well with us, and nor did it with women I spoke to in the community. So they were willing to step forward and say, we need a women, a commission on the status of women to address the special needs of women, issues like child care, um, fair wages, and many of the conditions in the schools. So we were very delighted when we got the unanimous vote. And I think the men who came around realized, just as someone said, they may not do, maybe they're not capable of other things, but they can count. And they saw who was there and how many. Just as the city manager used to tell me, he said, every week I have to go in and know that if at some point they're going to count to five, well, I might be leaving. So anyway, the, some of the accomplishments that I'm especially proud of, remember I'm not bragging, I'm sharing information, <laughs> is, that, is that we were able to work with many groups of different backgrounds. We worked especially hard with El Simplo de Acción Social to get the money that was needed for the renovations there. And that was not always easy, but we got it done by working together and by coming together and a common, the common good. When I, when I uh, years ago when I met Ron Dellums, he told me one of the most moving experiences he had was when Cesar Chavez visited him in Washington. And he said, I am not African American, but your fight is mine. Because if they come for you in the morning, they'll come for me in the afternoon. <laughs> so that was what, one of the ways that we did. We also are proud of the fact that we worked closely with the uh, Union Station to get their location on South Raymond. There were many objections to that, but we were able to overcome it by getting people of goodwill and people who had a social conscience to get those things done. Well, I don't want to take up, I don't know how much time I've taken up. Roberta is telling me, she's egging me on. <laughs> Go on. But, you know, that's, you know, my professor, if he's watching, he won't like this. Because I forgot to shut up on. I'll watch you back. Oh, you watch me back? Okay. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, I was going to say that there are many changes that have happened this year, just as uh, Ms. Mac Austin pointed out. As a veteran, one of the changes I saw this year at the American Legion Post 13 was the election of the first woman national commander for the American Legion, which is, a, over, which is 100 years old. The first woman in 100 years. And the American Legion is the largest veterans organization in the country and in the world. So I see signs of hope but we do need to all work together. I was also going to read for you some of the things that, something in, in particular that struck me. Uh, I know that people working together can get many things done. And that's why I, I like the idea of my mother telling me, you have to look for the good in people. And of Martin Luther King saying, you know, love is the one characteristic that will bring someone, bring your enemy along with you. Barbara Jordan, as you know, was, was the keynote speaker at the, and you see how disorganized I am, unlike when with Bert over there, at the uh, convention in, well, I'll just find the date here. Anyway, she, was, she pointed out that we have a common destiny and that we needed to come together and see how we could work for the better 
for the, what she called the common good. And I, I felt that what she said was very prophetic at that time, and also followed by Barack Obama giving his speech at the, at the convention, the Democratic National Convention. And trust me, I do have it here somewhere, <laughs> but not being the best organized. My daughter's looking at me like, well, my other daughter told me, when I told her, I said, I'm a little nervous and embarrassed about doing this, both for my voice and because I don't like talking about myself. She said, Mom, you're among friends. So just just have fun. And so, so, so that, that made me feel a little less, less nervous about this. Uh, and nobody expected me to be, oh, here it is, I did find it. Uh, in Barbara Jordan, as you know, was a very courageous congresswoman. And she said in the summer of 1976, we are a people in search of a national community. We are a people trying not only to solve the problems of the present, but we are attempting on a larger scale to fulfill the promise of America. We are attempting to fulfill our national purpose, to create and sustain a society in which all of us are equal. A nation is formed by the willingness of each of us to share in the responsibility of upholding the common good. We must define the common good and begin again to shape a common future. This was in the summer of 1976 in New York when Barbara Jordan stepped up to the microphone at the Democratic National Convention to deliver these words in the convention's keynote address and because became the first American woman in history to do so. The summer of 2004, when Barack Obama, U.S. Senator from Illinois, delivered an equally prophetic and brilliant speech at the Democratic National Convention, in which he called us all to the same challenge that Barbara Jordan had decades before. For alongside our famous individualism, I'll get my hot water this time, <laughs> There's another ingredient in the American saga, a belief that we are all connected as one people. If there is a child on the south side of Chicago who can't read, that matters to me, even if it's not my child. If there is a senior citizen somewhere who can't pay for their prescription drugs and having to choose between medicine and rent, that makes my life poorer, even if it's not my grandparents. If there is an Arab American family being rounded up with the benefit of an attorney or due process. That threatens my civil liberties. It is that fundamental belief, it is that fundamental belief that my brother's keeper, that I am my brother's keeper, and my sister's keeper, and that makes this country work. On January 20th, 2009, when Barack Obama was sworn in as the 44th President of the United States, he became the leader of a newly empowered national community and, believe, and led us forward on a journey to the, to the real American dream that Dr. Martin Luther King and Barbara Jordan and all Americans who desire to uphold the common good, that of striving to be our brother's keeper, our sister's keeper, and ensuring the equality of all members of our richly diverse family. I, I was going to call out some people who I felt in the past who, have, who aren't here to just tell you what the impact they had on my life and on the life of, of Pasadena. The League of Women Voters was one of the first organizations as a military wife when my husband was deployed to Korea that I joined. And I was mentored by June Owens, uh, Lee Hines, Marge White, Simba, June Owens, Marge White, Marguerite Ernstine, and others. And what I especially liked about that was they were willing to mentor me in ways that to, make, to have me get a better appreciation for citizen participation and for an informed citizenry. 
and for having open government and for having people able to go down and address their city council. I remember one time when June Owens and I met with a couple of members of the city council, male members, they accused the League of Women Voters of not being nonpartisan. And we said, well, we're not nonpartisan. We're not of the law of being partisan. I said, we're nonpartisan, but we're not nonpolitical. <laughs> and so that was not something that he particularly cared for. But anyway, I think I will end my part of it by simply relating something rather than going to some of the names here. I will just tell you about two things. I, I'm, I'm always inspired by inspirational words. The first one I have is a Cherokee Nation, Native American Ten Commandments. Trust the earth and all that dwells therein. Treat it with respect. Remain close to the Great Spirit God. Show great respect for your fellow beings. Work together for the benefit of all mankind. Give assistance and kindness wherever you can, wherever needed. Do what you know to be right. Look after the well-being of mind and body. Dedicate a share of your efforts to the greater good. Be truthful and honest at all times. And take responsibility for your actions. And because there are so many people in this room who I know are still out there fighting the good fight, I, I will give some names. I see Joe and Ruthie Hopkins, I know, who, who have the only African-owned newspaper that publishes them on a weekly basis and points out things of, that need to be addressed. We have uh, Monica Hubbard, whom I've said before. We have Juanita Tillman from the NAACP and the Lynx, I mean, and the uh, Delta Sigma Theta. And these are people who, Dr. Jeanette Mann, who has worked tirelessly on the issue of, of uh, foster care, foster care kids. I say that because it is true that, just as Martin Luther King said, everybody can serve. And I, I, I point out some of those people because I know there are many people who work behind the scenes, work quietly behind the scenes, and their efforts are not recognized or even appreciated when they are. But I know it makes a, it makes a difference. So I will, I will finally end this time. If the professor's there, I'm getting ready to shut up. <laughs> and I'll end it with uh, something that inspires me. It's Mother Teresa's Anyway Point. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies, but succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. But give the world the best you've got anyway. Because you see in the final analysis, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. Thank you. Are you feeling inspired? Because I know I am. Can we give Dolores another round of applause? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you for sharing your story. Our next honoree is Roberta Martinez. And Marna gave me the same instructions. Just keep it brief and to the point. But um, I wanted to make sure I said a few things that I wanted to not forget. Um, I'm honored to introduce Roberta as she exemplifies the role of a leader, a role model, and a community activist. Roberta is, Roberta is a published author, a historian, a producer, and the list of her accomplishments and recognitions is extensive. 
She's courageous and has been doing the work boots on the ground for many years. I have the pleasure to know Roberta for quite some time now, and every time I meet with her, I'm ready and eager to do more work. <laughs> Roberta understands that the best way to move forward and take control of our future is by learning and understanding our past, where we've been, the historical significance of people, places, and events. Roberta is an influential Latina from Pasadena, and we are fortunate to have her giving back to our community. I am humbled to introduce her and also to call her a friend. Ladies and gentlemen, Roberta Martinez. No pressure. <laughs> You know what, could we all just rise and give Dolores a standing ovation, please? <laughs> so there are two things I want to mention before I get going into my story, which is it feels really weird. Dolores and I actually are very similar in that when I'm usually speaking in front of a group, I'm talking about the people whose pictures you're seeing, the history that's taking place, and not about me. Uh, neither of my kids believe that I'm shy, but I really sort of am, because if you think about it, you probably don't know a lot of details about me. Um, I should mention while I'm up here two things. The first that Dolores and I both shared is that we're both cancer survivors. Um, I, the grace, the grace of God, good beings, or, or, or good genes, however you want to look at it, because I have buddies that are atheists, too. Um, but I, the reason I mention that is because I think one of the things when we have health issues happen to us, it's good to remember that we can move on. However we might be limited, if the spirit is there, if our body can help us moving forward, if we have the love and the support of our friends and our family, we move on. And I know that neither one of us would be where we are today were it not for our friends and our family. And I thank you for that. I should mention, well, I'm going to get all weepy, it turns out. I should mention while I'm up here how blown away I am by the thought that I'm being recognized at the same time as folks are recognizing Dolores Hickenbottom. Dolores and I got to know each other when we met at the funeral mass for Marco Fireball. We spent the day together. I loved to drive. Dolores didn't want to have anything to do with it, and we had to go way out to uh, Rose Hills, so we had time. Um, he was a man who, like Dolores, was politically astute and whose political motivation was driven by doing what's right for all, especially the underserved. It is an honor to be with her tonight, and an even greater honor and privilege to call him my friend. Thank you, Dolores. So, when people ask me what I do, I'm often sure, not sure what to say. I have to admit that activist is not the first word that comes to mind. Advocate, or teacher, or writer, or some other word might come, be in that place. Years ago, I asked my son for his suggestion because he's really great with words, and he shared historical interpreter. <laughs> I asked him what that meant, and he said, you study things, and then you share them in different ways. And that gave me a license to just go off and do whatever I needed to do to get that history shared. He was brilliant and to the point, and I love him for that and so many more reasons. When people ask me how I came to do this work that they're looking at, you know, as historic, historical or writer or whatever, I have several different answers that I'll give depending on how well I know them and how long we have to talk. Or whether or not the answer precedes my needing to write or present something, or whether they're being mostly polite. The short answer can be, I focus on people who are parts of marginalized communities. The three groups I mostly research are women, Latinos, Latinos, Latinas, Latinos, Latinx, and worker peoples. I know the last grouping is just this side of cute, and I use it intentionally. People almost always react to it 
positively. And I think they react to this because most of them have family members who have been working class, who were working class, or they themselves were of the working class. They identify as such or connect with them, and they realize that folks that are doing that sort of work are those that are often unsung, doing unsung jobs that keep our civic and other public institutions running. I am a second generation American. My grandparents all came from Mexico between 1903 and 1909. They and my parents lived a life that was surrounded by working class experiences. My dad, Pete, was born in Los Angeles. He was a stinker, he was mischievous. He was the baby in the family. And he grew up in what could be viewed as a Dickensian sort of poverty. His father died by the time he was nine. My dad's mother struggled to provide for her children as best she could. She spoke only Spanish and she was illiterate to provide for her family, she worked at a tortilleria, making tortillas by hand, one after another, after another, after another, for the length of her workday. My mom, Nellie, was born in El Paso, Texas, after her single mother came from Mexico. They lived in El Paso for a short time before they moved to Colorado. Her paternal line had family members who worked in the fields, in the mines and at the steel mill in Pueblo, Colorado. Her maternal line had similar jobs, but they had the benefit of being literate. And then, as now, that made a huge difference in their lives. Dad spoke English to his mother, but the language of the streets at the time was English. She did only answered in Spanish because that was her only language. Mom grew up surrounded by family that spoke Spanish and English. Her grandmother, who raised her, was born in the 1850s. Think about that. She was born in the 1850s. Social formality, rich in 19th century practices, was a part of my mom's day-to-day -day life. She could not go to a dance without a dueña being present. My mother excelled in school because she didn't know she was, was not supposed to do well and because she had great grit. My dad, on the other hand, he knew what was cool to him, and he pretty much had no one to tell him what to do. Being the baby in the family and being of the streets, little was expected of him. It was through family, friends, and ties that my parents met. Mom was a great friend of my dad's sister, Martha. As my mother would tell me about their meeting, here comes Martha's brother Pete, coming in like a sheep herder. Hi, he said. And that was that. They dated for three months before they got married at La Placita in Los Angeles. And 11 months later, when my mom was 39, I was born. My mother miscarried a second pregnancy five years later. I lived the life of an only child very different from most of my schoolmates. So how does that get us to what it is I do? Well, both my parents lived through both world wars and influenza and the 20s and the Great Depression. When they would talk to each other over dinner, I would hear about the causes, the images, and the songs that had been a part of US history long before I read about them in books. Their stories gave me a sense of place, of belonging, of being a part of what came before. For me, history wasn't dull names in a textbook. It was hearing the stories of my parents' lives. The day the landlord came knocking on the door, ready to evict my dad's family, and they ran out the back door. <laughs> or the day my mom played hooky and got in trouble just because she had gone to see a minstrel show. The look on my dad's face when he talked about being stationed in Japan during World War II and wanting desperately to bring home a dog that he'd had as a pet. Or my mom talking with pride about knitting for the WPA. Their stories were oral histories. 
history was alive in our house. Mom shared that people were always trying to set her up with someone. She didn't get married till she was 38. How could she bear to be a spinster? And she would reply, I have my own job, my own dog, and my own apartment. I don't need a man. <laughs> now this is the one that's being brought up by the grandmother who was born in 1850. She loved to tell that story, and it was filled with independence and pride. Dominican writer and Pulitzer, Dominican American writer and Pulitzer Prize winner Juno Diaz put it beautifully. We hear our parents talking all the time about places they grew up around, or events that happened before we could remember. If we have the good, if we are fortunate, we grow up with our grandparents and they bring an entirely different world. We're shaped by people and places we've never even met. Stories bind us across time and space. Stories bind us across time and space. I may not have always been secure about how I looked or what I could do, but those stories provided a, pro a foundation for me. There were stories of poverty and pain, but there were also stories of accomplishments and confidence. I grew up knowing that I was connected to those stories. I also grew up in a time of social change. I'm a Catholic who was brought up post-Vatican II, and post-Vatican II is radically different from post-pre-Vatican II, and anybody who knows Catholics is nodding their head at this point, right? <laughs> Fifty years ago, I was at Garfield High School when the walkouts occurred. I embraced the ideals of social ideals, of social revolution, and I thought of myself as a radical. I wore jeans. <laughs> I was also a Girl Scout. And as a scout, I learned about the world, and I learned about what I now think of as feminism. Music had always been a part of my life. My dad and my grandpa were musical. So when it was time for me to go to college, I became a music major. Always thinking about getting the big bucks, right? The money, right? <laughs> I was an ill-prepared student. I wasn't ready for college, so after a time, I married, had a baby, and dropped out of school in that sequence. I had become a college administrator's wife and learned that women could be just as sexist as any man. Many of the other wives at the college felt I was wrong to keep my birth name. I should have my husband's last name. After all, I hadn't accomplished anything. I was 23. I didn't buy it. And many is the name tag I wore that had my ex's last name scratched out and Martinez written in pen. Six years later, I was ready to go back to school and to leave my first marriage. And just when I was ready to date, boom, there comes James, the love of my life. I was gonna be, I was gonna be single, I was gonna date. When we got married, I completed my BA and my MA in music history, and we moved to Pasadena. We rejoiced when we bought our house, and we were beside ourselves when we saw that a black woman, Loretta Glickman, was our mayor. The next 15 years zoomed by, and after several miscarriages, we were lucky that our son, Matthew, became a part of our family. We have our daughter, Kate. I didn't mention her. I should mention her. Equal time. <laughs> but there was another layer that was going on that I experienced. You see, Matthew is adopted, and when he was little, still is fair-skinned, but his hair was blonde and his eyes were blue. And one day a woman came up to me, who knew he was adopted, and asked me how it was that my husband and I had gotten a white child when there were so many white people who wanted to adopt. I answered, I don't know. I didn't know what to do with that. I was bothered by her comment, but had other things to think about. We would now think of this as a microaggression. At the time, I thought it was just rude. Over the next several years, I began to teach at St. Mark's in Altadena. 
It wasn't my academic training, but it did allow me time to be with our children and my aging parents. I taught preschool and Spanish as a second language to older elementary school children. As different as those topics might seem, they actually were both about cultural and linguistic acquisition in a school setting. I loved introducing the world to the children and I learned so much as I did so. Our family had good times and rough times and we traveled across the United States to Mexico and to Europe. I have to let you know that we loved Ireland just passionately. I hope, how could you not? As the children were growing older, I had a chance to work for the ADL in the A World of Difference program. I eventually quit teaching and for a while worked as a per diem facilitator. It was like earning another degree. It was a field of study that looked at bias, discrimination, and prejudice in its many forms. I learned about racism and the many other isms that can be just as powerful and just as painful. That idea that a person who is different is less than. Sexism, ageism, orientationism, all of these can be potent labels and can deny someone their full worth. It was about this time that I came to learn of something of the complexities of Pasadena. I'd learned about the past by reading the Star News, and it was exciting to learn something of black history because you would often find it included in the paper. I wondered if Latinas and Latinos had ever been a part of Pasadena's history. Probably not. There was never any mention of them. It was a joy to meet Manny Contreras, who is an elder who I think is probably close to 90 at this point, who at the time was the president of the Pasadena Mexican American History Association. He shared stories with me. He shared pictures with me. He opened a door for me. And I began to meet so many of his contemporaries. I began to hear story after story after story, and I so wanted to share those stories. Then one day, my family and I were at the Irish Parade. We had an Irish Parade here, and it was on Green Street. <laughs> We were there with about a thousand people and I thought that there were probably as many people who were in the city who would be interested in Latino heritage. And that's how the Latino parade came to be. That was the beginning of a 15 year journey that was filled with ups and downs. Among the downs, let me do the ups first. I always like to do the ups first. You give the sugar first, right? So among the ups was getting a chance to work with people I would have never worked with otherwise, to have opportunities to bring people in from every background, every or all of those isms, knock them out. They're gone. We're all working together and we're sharing, we're having a good time, and we're looking at what happened within the community, what happened within the world, and what specifically was happening in Pasadena. Everyone was welcome, except for people that were snooty and too full of themselves. They could leave. Um, I have to say that the committee members for the parade over those 15 years became family. We sweated together. There are people in this room who went under platforms to screw things in. There was the one time where we were all so close. We were at Washington Park, and there was a child that was missing. A notice was made. Everyone froze in position. Nobody spoke until that child was found. That's profound. That's community. That's powerful, and that's working together. Among the downs, though, was a meeting that took place with an extremely high-ranking city official in City Hall. Prior to the meeting, a couple of us parade committee members had met with the late, great Christine Harris, who used to be the director at Jackie Robinson. 
and it was she who led the organizing for the Black History Parade. And it was she who gave us a copy of the budget that they had for the Black History Parade. We took the budget with us to begin a discussion that we hoped would lead to some sort of closer effort at equity uh, treatment for the Latino Heritage History Parade, as it would known it that way at that time. Not to take away from the Black History Parade, but to find more support for the Latino <coughs> History Parade. The administrator, who was black, leaned over the desk between us and said, your people's time hasn't come. We were very clearly not in microaggression territory. There were times when we were treated in other ways that were discriminatory, but we were determined to share our history and to do so with an emphasis on pride and not on retribution. All were welcome to participate, all were welcome to bring their gifts, and all of us were better for the shared experience. Among the other ups along the way was getting a chance to host and produce a TV show, Casa Martinez. Off and on over the past 20, thank you, Pasadena Media. <laughs> Off and on over the past 20 years, we've taped, taped almost 200 episodes. Uh, the titles have ranged Oh my gosh, it's covered anything and everything we've wanted to, to cover. Everything from guitarron, 20 minutes discussing guitarron, to talking about what comedy is, to talking about what it's like. Uh, one fellow by the name of Cyrus Wong, who very definitely, if you were to meet him on the street, would think that he was African American, which that was part of who he was. But the other part of him was somebody whose family, his grandfather, was Chinese. And when the Chinese and when the blacks were no longer going to be slaves in Cuba, they brought in the Chinese. And that was where his grandfather came to be in Cuba. And as Cyrus was was growing up, he was a tall man, he was really, really tall. He said that he would come into his, his uh, family's home, and there in the foyer would be this image of these ch this Chinese man. And he had no idea who that man was. So the complexity of our heritages was, is part of what we get to discuss on Casa Martinez. It's dedicated to exploring arts, culture, history, and identity, and we cover it all. The book's Latinos in Pasadena was begun in 2006 after attending a historical exhibit where Latinas and Latinos were ag again omitted as part of a story. The book took a year to write, and almost all of the images are specific to the San Gabriel Valley. It was really important to me that we have our San Gabriel Valley images, not just Los Angeles images, even though I'm from East LA, included in the book. Images came from the Huntington Library, the Pasadena Museum of History, the other archives of great renown, and shoe boxes that held old pictures, and Xerox copies of pictures because they no longer had the original pictures. I've had the good fortune to serve on boards and commissions and task forces, and all of which, all of these things led me to decide that I needed to run for office. And I encourage any woman here, if you think if there's a burning it feeling in you for change, do it. And if it's not in your gut, support a woman who has that feeling. Because we don't have to agree with each other a thousand percent. We just have to agree that they're there with a good heart, they will listen reasonably, and they're there for the common good. I lost the election by about three percent. I am so happy for that. We as a group, well, no, that, that was, there might be some days where I'm really happy that I lost. But we as a group worked together. People who had never been involved in politics came together. We didn't have cell phones at that time, but if we had, they would have been sounding a lot. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done. When we were running the parade in Jamaica, we typically ran, we uh, typically had a budget where we raised from 10 to 17,000 dollars 
for the parade. Any of you who know from parades know that that's really, really teeny. Last year, the budget for the Latino Heritage Parade, which is now being led by the city, had a budget of $1,000. There's work to be done. Um, there's also work to be done. I love the libraries and had joy being on the Library Commission. We live in a city that is a third Latino. We do not have a Latino heritage collection, nor do we have a place for it to reside. There's work to be done. I think if you think of other parts of our city, there are places where we need to have greater visibility. We need to support that. We need to figure out, so how do we get this story that we have and share it? Not this one's better, not that one's better, but all of them together, all of these experiences are our shared history if we live in this city, if we live in this valley, if we live in this state, if we live in this country. Anne Lamott, in her book Bird by Bird, shared that rituals are a good signal to your unconscious that it's time to kick in. And so I would like to end this with a ritual that we used to do every year at the parade and that I like to do with groups. And that is a clap of unity. It's something, those of you that are aware of what it is, please join me. And what we do is we begin very slowly and then we let the momentum rise. So please join me. Feel each other. Que viva la mujer. Que viva la mujer. Que viva la mujer. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. There's work to be done. If we can have both you and Dolores come up. And Councilmember McCoston. more great thing about having women on the city council, more hugging, more kissing, <laughs> much more friendly. Okay, so I have a couple of certificates from the city of Pasadena that I would like to present to these women, and they're very short, but I want to read them because they're very important, and I think they describe the essence of these women. So, a certificate of recognition to Dolores Hickenbottom. Congratulations upon being recognized by the Commission on the Status of Women for advancing the needs and concerns of women of all ages, races, and cultural backgrounds, and gratitude for your unwavering quest for equality in social, political, and educational opportunities. Signed, Mayor Terry Tornick. Congratulations upon being recognized by the Commission on the Status of Women for your work in drawing attention to the many contributions made by women of all ages, races, and cultural backgrounds to the betterment of Pasadena. By bringing light to the stories of so many, you have highlighted the richness of Pasadena. Mm -hmm. Signed, Mayor, Mayor Terry Tornick.
We also have certificates from the office of Senator Portantino. Is his representative still here? No, he left it. We don't need to hear. <laughs> so on behalf of uh, Senator Portantino, we also have an award for both Roberta Martinez and Dolores Hickenbottom. I'm glad you should also get that. And on behalf of the entire Commission on the Status of Women, we are honored to have you to inspire us and to work on the work that needs to be done. Can we give them another round of applause? <laughs> and before we close the program, I would like to do one more recognition. I would like to ask Commissioner Marna Carnell to please come up. Commissioner Cornell was the chair for the event and she worked endless hours and we appreciate all everything that she does and her leadership. And can we please give her a round of applause? So in closing, we want to thank all of you for attending and the City of Pasadena Commission on the Status of Women's first year's Her Story event. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>